In March, I wrote a talk for the Lent series called Music as Travel Agent. Travel agents got a bad press in 2019, but 2020 saw the notion of travel as itself rather fraught. Yet the idea that music makes us travel is still worth reflecting on. When we say that a piece moves us or that a performance was moving, we perhaps forget that we're admitting that we are somehow changed by it. A physical move changes our location, but an emotional, spiritual or intellectual move means we have also been changed. Being open to the discoveries from such encounters does not, of course, mean that we have to like them. Faith entails an element of responsibility, and so we should try to discern if these changes are good for us. Both music and faith have an effect on our lives, and it's possible that the experience of music can influence how our lives develop. The four short talks will highlight how music, or a musical mindset, or a musicological understanding can underpin and flesh out several theological dimensions or approaches. The first is, can music aid scriptural understanding? Music is a performed art, as is poetry. This means that the sound of it makes a, is a vital part of its life and is not simply the outward manifestation of an inward grace. Music directly affects our bodies and not just our brains. We may think that the text of a score is the instructions or the recipe, but the cooking of it or the way it is delivered is far from peripheral to its impact. This has a direct parallel with biblical scripture. The squiggles in Hebrew, for example, have to be renegotiated into the vernacular, noticing that some of it is specific to the culture. And yet, even when one has decoded the text, which of course may be multi-layered and ambiguous, the implications of it may be alien or disorientating. Texts have a way of saying more than they say. Many pieces have traditions attached. For instance, the famous climactic long note in Puccini's Ness and Dorma is notated as a semiquaver, which is usually a quick note. Yet not one of the 76 recordings I have found skips over it, as a literalist might demand. While it's right to read the text for oneself, one has also to be cognizant of its heritage. So far, so biblical, one might say. And in much early music, say a Handel recorder sonata, the text of a simple melody would be expected to be decorated on its repeat. The text, rather like a biblical text, is not altered graphically, but its delivery requires adaptation. A tune with leaps in might find these gaps filled in, for example, and even a stepwise melody might find each step polished a little by gracefully squeezed notes. I'm not a recorder player, but here is the beginning of a Handel recorder sonata. Rubbish. So far, so pretty. But the opening arpeggio, which is those gap notes, might well be played something like this. Or it could be even more elegantly done. And that would still count as being bottled by hand. Even stranger, perhaps, is that some notes can sound even if they're not played. Uh, Yehudi Menuhin, when he played Bach's solo violin music, would often place a brick on the piano behind him so that various strings would vibrate in sympathy with his playing and create a kind of sonic halo. Instruments sound different because of the combination of overtones their sounds produce. A clarinet, for example, has a very prominent overtone, an octave and a half above the played note. And if you've ever heard a clarinet sort of sound on the organ, it'll be because I'm mimicking that with a combination. Is clarinet-like because what's happening I'm, when I'm playing that note, I'm also playing those notes so that one is building up a kind of profile of the note, uh, fooling the ear, if that's the word, that, that there's more going on than there is. In a story, of course, you are reading overtly expressed pitches, as it were, but there are sounds which one has to listen out for. In faith terms, that means that we should be alert to the people on stage who don't talk and to the issues that aren't addressed. While composers do notate their instructions accurately, the fact that the same Mozart symphony played by two different orchestras can affect us differently suggests that the dots are not the whole story. 
There's our own context, our current emotional state, our cultural awareness, and so many other factors affect how we listen. Performers, to sometimes have to make up some of the music for themselves. In a Baroque trio sonata, for example, which you need four people for, but different story, two violins play complementary melodies, a cello plays the bass line, and a harpsichord plays the bass and any other notes that fit nicely. Even if a composer does specify the chord to be used, that doesn't say anything about its position, its rhythmic profile, or the mood needing to be captured. So Handel, or somebody, might write an F major chord, but it doesn't say which bit of the F major chord needs to be used at a particular point. The way one fleshes this bald bass line makes a huge difference, and the player's ability to discern what is appropriate is vital. The word we use for this job is called realisation, and it's revealing that in colloquial speak, realisation means when we suddenly wake up and notice a connection we've missed, we realise something too late, or only understood it when something else hit us. Yet this disciplined improvisation has real relevance in the context of a reawakening of our senses. For if music is a performed art, where the text is only brought to life in our realised enacting of it, then it's perhaps okay to suggest that the Bible text on the page is only brought to life in our enacting of it too. It means that as Christians, we cannot just read the Bible, but we have to somehow perform the Bible. And to help us perform, the next two talks will deal with being in time and being in tune.